Okay. Um, I will be speaking, I'll try to speak slowly, but if uh, something is not understandable, just raise your hand and I'll repeat in English, uh, because that's the only, well, that's the only language I can speak very well for this kind of lecture. So I, I want to talk today about uh, some studies that we do uh, that have to do with uh, national, you want to use this? Is that, can you hear me better? Um, well, I want to talk about some studies that we do that have to do with uh, issues of national identity and national memory, collective memory. And in particular, I'll use Russia as a case study as an example, but the ideas apply to any modern country, I, I want to claim, at the end. I want to start with this idea of a mnemonic standoffs, where we have opposition, we have conflict over how to remember the past. There are many mnemonic standoffs in the world today. Um, what's interesting about them is we oftentimes get very emotional about the, how we remember the past in these mnemonic standoffs. We can have a good rational argument about differences in ideology, or we can say, you know, I think you have a different uh, values than I do. But when we talk about past events, many times we don't have a good way of negotiating our difference. We just get into a very strong opposition. We, we don't know how to get out of it. So for example, India and Pakistan today, two big countries, they have completely different ideas about what happened in 1947. Israelis and Palestinians, completely different ideas about what happened in 1948 when the state of Israel was formed. And I want to talk about a particular case about Estonia, a very small country versus Russia, in the way it remembers uh, the liberation, as the Russians would call it, or the occupation of Estonia at the end of the Great Patriotic War. So I want to start with uh, the, the, the the dispute or the conflict in this case, the mnemonic standoff, had to do with a statue in Tallinn and what in Tallinn, the capital of Estonia. And what happened when the Estonian government decided to move the statue from the center of the city to a military cemetery. This is very emotional. First of all, there's the, it's called the bronze statue. It's to the liberators, also Vito uh, Tallinn. Uh, this is a picture of a bronze statue, a bronze soldier in the, his old location. Here's somebody bringing flowers. This is a very active site of memory. Somebody coming to bring flowers and light a candle. You can see down here, this is the winter, obviously. But uh, different people had been still bringing flowers to this statue. So this is an active place of memory. But the problem is, when they decided to move this statue, they had a huge, you probably remember this, in 2007. When they decided to move the statue, they had a riot in Tallinn. And it went on for two nights. And, and it was un, in Tallinn, they never have riots. In Estonia, they don't have riots. But they did when they tried to move the statue. The rioters went on for two nights. This is actually an interesting picture because it's provided by a Russian news service. You see the Russian Orthodox Church, the, the way this picture is taken. <laughs> it's an interesting visual kind of representation. But the riots themselves, they went on for two nights. There was one death, young man, a Russian, uh, ethnic Russian. I mean, by the way, in Estonia, there is about one and a half million people. One million ethnic Estonians, about 500,000 Russians. So one third of the population is national, Russian national population in Estonia. And they still have problems deciding if they're really Estonian or they're Russian or whatever. But uh, in this 
in these riots, uh, there's one death, there were 100 injuries, and 1,000 arrests over two nights. And that's a very unusual thing to happen in Estonia. It's a very peaceful, orderly place. Um, as reported in the Estonian newspapers, the people rioting were mostly Russian-speaking youths. That's another way of saying na Russian national people in Estonia. And what happened though, is during the riots and afterwards, there was this extreme angry response from Russia, from Russians in Estonia, in Russia, and elsewhere in the world. They were very, very angry about this idea of moving the statue, how to, how to remember the past, and the statue represented something, you're going to betray the memory of the past, and this is very serious. So, for example, on Victory Day, uh, following that riot, Putin talked about we should never let people betray the past. Those who don't respect the past are, are can be enemies of ours. It's very strong language. Um, there was a huge cyber attack coming from Russia. Not from the Russian government, probably, but we don't know. But from many places in Russia, there's a huge cyber attack on Estonia. Sometimes it's called Estonia because it's the most, maybe the most wired notion, uh, nation in the earth, the most wireless nation on earth. Uh, and so it's a very serious attack. And actually, this is still taken by the Pentagon as the case study for cyber, cyber attacks, because it's very serious. It almost uh, shut down some of the government, some of the banks in Estonia. Um, there's a group, probably some of you know about this, uh, Nashi, uh, Russian youth group, uh, who started up riots, or not riots, but marches. Um, they picketed, they, they surrounded the Estonian embassy in uh, Moscow, and really uh, demonstrated against the uh, moving of the statue. Uh, it's important to remember, the statue was moved. It wasn't destroyed. It wasn't destroyed. It wasn't cut up. Uh, it was moved from one place in the center of the city to a military cemetery where there are Russian, or well, Soviet soldiers and sailors buried at the military cemetery. So it's a very respectful thing, but it still was a very emotional kind of uh, reaction that we got in Russia. Um, so, for example, the Nashi talking, they had a big demonstration in Moscow and following the uh, moving of the statue, and even six months later, and even late, longer, later than that, they still had on their homepage of Nashi uh, a picture of the bronze soldier and talk about the Estonian fascism, uh, Estonian ghost fascism. Here's the demonstration in 2007 in Moscow. Um, you can see these are young people uh, from the Russian, what we could say, from the Russian uh, community, from the Russian collective community, demonstrating in memory of the one person who died in the riots there. His name is Dmitry Ganin. Um, and it's not entirely clear how he died, but nonetheless, the Nashi came out in big numbers uh, to sell to memorialize uh, this hero of the, the, the disputes. Uh, and again, what's interesting about this dispute is it's about the past. It's suddenly, you change, somebody says, we're going to change the memory, and people get very, very upset about this. So then, what I want to talk about a little bit here, this is a dispute about memory and not about history. I, need, I think it's important to distinguish between memory and history when talking about these issues. It's actually sometimes difficult to maintain a distinction between memory and history, but these are two different ways of relating to the past. And we'll talk, I'll talk about it a fair amount here. And so we could say more specifically, it's the difference between what you could call formal history, the kind of analytic history that professional historians are supposed to do, and collective memory. Um, so, for example, a long time ago, people like the French uh, historian, Ernst, uh, Ernst Renan, talked about the difference between history and memory, saying that actually all nations have to get their memory, have to have, have, to get their, have, to have a historical error, a factual error, you could say, in collective memory. That's important for practically every nation that cannot be completely accurate historically. Rather, it's a memory problem. It's a memory issue, not a historic, historical issue. One of the modern analysts of memory, uh, Pierre Narat, has also talked about how history is a threat to memory. Okay, well, I'll talk more about this. But the point is here, 
that history and memory are two quite different ways of relating to the past. And what we're seeing with the Russian uh, community being so angry, that's about memory. It's not about, in this term, history. Here's some ways of thinking about the differences between uh, collective memory and formal history. In collective memory, you tend to talk about the past from a single, emotionally committed perspective. You have a commitment to a particular interpretation. In formal history, you aspire to give an objective account, to say uh, there are different perspectives, there's not a single perspective, we have to take different perspectives into account. Similarly, in collective memory, there's a kind of, you don't want to hear about different accounts. You're, you're uh, impatient with ambiguity, especially any moral ambiguity. So, for example, if we say, well, actually, when the Russians, when the Red Army came to uh, Estonia in 1944, there were good things and there were bad things. Well, if you're Estonian, no, there were bad things only. If you're Russians, there were good things only. So you're impatient with ambiguity in the case of memory. On the other hand, in history, we recognize and you try to deal with the complexity. You say there are different perspectives and you have to understand how they fit together. Um, collective memory is tied to an identity project. It's about who we are and who our identity is. Whereas uh, in formal uh, history, we're saying we follow the objective evidence. Even if you don't like to hear this, even if it's against your identity, we still will talk about it in formal history. Two different ways of talking about the past that you can summarize in this simple way, I think. You say, in collective memory, in those cases, you're loyal to the narrative at the expense of evidence. If you have to give up evidence, if you have to ignore evidence, if you have to say, uh, well, I just, I don't want to pay any attention to that, you will do that in order to keep the, mem the narrative about the past intact. In the case of formal history, you're loyal to evidence at the expense of the narrative. What's this mean? It means that if you're a professional historian, a formal historian, the way you make your career, at least in America, by being a historian in a history department, is you take a narrative that somebody else has already provided, maybe about the American Civil War, and that somebody says the Civil War was basically about slavery. Uh, it's a story about the fight against slavery. And you can make your career by saying, no, that guy was wrong. I have new evidence from archives that shows the Civil War was really about political union. And so you're saying that narrative was wrong because of new evidence. And that's how I actually push the history forward. In memory, we don't like to change the narrative. We are very resistant to that kind of change. Memory is so resistant to change that sometimes we can talk about it in terms, of, it's a term that you hear a lot in our popular press these days called cultural DNA. You say the cultural DNA of Americans or the cultural DNA of Georgians or the cultural DNA of Russians is something or other. Uh, this comes actually, this guy Robert Kagan, for example, is a neocon, a uh, neoconservative. Uh, so he's not just some kind of postmodernist, he's a neocon who says, uh, talks about the myth of American innocence and says actually it's in the cultural DNA to have ex what he calls aggressive expansionism. He's thinking about how colonial America expanded, pushed away Native Americans, pushed out the French, pushed out the British, pushed out the Spanish. That's what American history was about for a long time. And he's, he's using this term. It's in the uh, uh, American DNA. Other popular, widely read scholars like Fareed Zakaria, uh, who writes about globalism, or one of our most po popular uh, newspaper columnists, David Brooks, they talk about the American DNA and cultural DNA, the Chinese, the Indian. So this is a term that we use a lot, and I want to see why we are tempted to use this term. Because nobody is saying it's biochemical DNA, we're saying it's cultural DNA. It's something that's not, it's got to be something different. It's the kind of thing that's reflected, you can see it in textbooks, media, monuments, okay? If you think about this term, cultural DNA, well, what's it, what could it possibly mean? It could be just a, a bad term, or it could be a term that we have to unpack, have to understand. And I'd say it's, it's an interest, there's some interest here because, like biochemical DNA, the idea is there must be some underlying code that's distinct from the surface manifestation. There's some underlying code you cannot see by looking at that monument, just like you cannot look at me now and say, oh, I know what his DNA is. No, it's DNA, my DNA, you have to take a sample, you have to do a genomics analysis to get to the underlying code. So similarly, in the case of cultural DNA, we should look for the underlying code. 
We expect to have different codes for different groups, obviously. That's what the DNA suggests here. And also, as in biochemical DNA, it's, it's pretty hard to change this code. It's very hard to change it. We do have genetic engineering and things like that, but I think just as in biochemical DNA, in cultural DNA, it's fairly hard to change the underlying code. And what I'm going to suggest is that national narratives serve as the underlying code. So that's the kind of cultural DNA. That they don't realize this, but when you're using the term cultural DNA, they're talking about national narratives, I think. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to say a little bit about national narratives here as, as what I would call cultural tools. This notion of tool is very important. Cultural tools, the notion of cultural tools comes from people like uh, Ernest Kassir, uh, in the Russian tradition, Mikhail uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, Leftsmianich Vygotsky. We find a lot of different theory, theoretical foundations for this, um, and the, mostly in the German and then there's a lot of the Russian, but the European, the continental tradition. Um, and from this perspective, you say the narrative tools the kind of narrative tools I'm going to talk about here. They shape the way we can think and speak. They don't make us think and speak in certain ways. They're tools. They have to be used by active agents. But the active agents actually are more shaped by these tools than they realize. There's an expression in English, uh, and you probably have something analogous to this in Georgian, but there's an expression in English that if you take a hammer, you know, the tool of a hammer, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It looks like something to be hit. That's the only thing that the hammer is a tool is good for. Well, for a cultural narrative as a tool, everything starts to look like material for it. Okay? So in that sense, it shapes the way we think and speak. It doesn't determine it, but it shapes it more than we realize, I think. And in a sense, the, the underlying cultural tools here are almost co-authors. If I and my cultural tool are doing the thinking and speaking from this perspective. And so we need to understand their structure and their emotional power to understand how they play this role like they did in, in town. There are two levels of narrative analysis that I think we have to do, just like in, it's in a sense like a DNA analogy. I want to talk about specific narratives and narrative templates. That, the narrative templates are the underlying code. So specific narratives talk about specific or concrete settings, dates, actors. Here's a specific narrative that if you're over 40, you know by heart uh, some version of this. This is a kind of uh, Soviet uh, account of specific narrative of what happened in the Great Patriotic War, uh, Great Fatherland War. And I, I could, I've studied this enough that I can just write this out, you know. But notice it has, though, it has specific act, concrete dates, concrete actors, concrete places. Okay, that's the hallmarks of a specific narrative. It has these uh, concrete pieces of information in it. Okay, narrative templates is the underlying code, and this is what I want to spend most time talking about here. Um, a narrative template combined has a kind of complex structure because it combines a schematic structure, that means a very generalized, abstract, non-specific structure, uh, content in it. The content always has temporal organization, so narrative is always about things that happen in temporal sequence of some kind. The events have some kind of temporal sequence. Uh, and it has a plot. It has a way of grasping together, drawing together the events into some kind of storyline. Okay, so that's, that's true of any, uh, that's true of a specific narrative or a narrative template. But again, it has a temporal organization and a plot. The notion of a narrative template is consistent with a lot of work we see in cognitive science today, in uh, contemporary cognitive science, where you see that uh, in cognitive science, humans are talked about as using schemas. A lot of we talk about schemas as a generalized kind of uh, cognitive structure. We talk about humans as pattern recognizers. Basically, we know a lot now in cognitive science that the way we as humans process information is different from the way that, that most computers process information. We don't process all the information. We look at, we find patterns. We're very good at finding patterns. You think about facial recognition. It's actually very complex, but we've evolved as humans. So you can look at a face and you can distinguish everybody very quickly in facial recognition. It turns out to be very hard. We're getting closer with computers, but they do it in different ways to do facial recognition. But humans are basically pattern recognizers. We use patterns <coughs> that, that we immediately recognize and use rather than going through all the logical, logical uh, possibilities like a computer can do. We're playing chess, a computer can play all the different options instantaneously. 
That's not how grandmasters play chess. And actually, grandmasters cannot beat computers anymore, by the way. But also, we talk about humans as cognitive misers. What this means is that humans have to be efficient because we don't have the processing space like a modern computer, a supercomputer, to do massive amounts of information processing. We have to figure out efficient heuristics, simple ways of doing things. Um, and so it doesn't mean we're lazy, lazy, but it does mean that we take shortcuts when we process information. That's what a lot of these this underlying code of narrative templates is about. It's a shortcut that has advantages, has great power, but great disadvantages as well. So on the one hand, narrative templates are characterized by the fact that they have this very general schematic structure. On the other hand, at the same time, they have a particularistic or very specific identity perspective built into them. So a narrative template, on the one hand, is very general, but it also is from one national perspective. It's not just anybody's narrative template. It, it also includes the strong element of what some other analysts have called ethnocentric narcissism. What this means is we look at the world, when we use a narrative template as a tool, we're looking at the world from an ethnocentric, from our own perspective, and the narcissism is not something that means you're selfish. It means that you have a very difficult time understanding another perspective, or at least believing that somebody could have another perspective. I mean, ask the Estonians, can Russians really believe that they liberated? That's the story of liberation. They, they, it's really hard for Estonians to understand the Russian perspective, and vice versa. It's very hard for Russians to understand, how can Estonians think that we did not liberate? How can they think we occupied? Uh, and some of you might have different opinions here about uh, this kind of thing, but in America, uh, you know, we oftentimes, how could, you know, how could Iraq not think that America was there to help liberate? And so we, we have, these, these are things that are beyond cognitive rationality. They're, they're products of this kind of very ethnocentrically narcissistic perspective. And narcissism here is not a disease, not usually. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, it's not selfishness. It's an in cognitive inability to understand or believe others can have other perspectives. So here's what I would put out as a kind of uh, the Russian national narrative. It's what they call the expulsion of any enemies, Russian national te narrative template. And it's, it's very simple. You see, it's very generic, very schematic. It says, first, the Russians are there. Nobody's bothering. Uh, it, Russia is peaceful and not interfering with others. Then somebody attacks Russia for no very good reason, but attacks it very viciously. Russia almost loses everything. It almost loses its whole civilization. It's step three, it suffers from enemy's attacks. And finally, though, Russia comes back and through heroism and exceptionalism, overcomes the enemy and expels the enemy from uh, Russian territory. It's the basic idea here. This is a very general storyline, and some people might see, oh, well, that sounds like you could, think of other, you could think of other countries that have a similar, it's so general it seems to apply to other countries, maybe. <laughs> Except notice, uh, Russia is always in here because that's the narcissistic part uh, that's a reminder that that's still there. In order to be a template, I want to use this word template, it means that the kind of thing we're looking at has to have more than one instantiation, more than one specific narrative. If it only applies to one episode, then it's not a template, because a template is a pattern that stamps out different examples or specific narratives. So here's a list, for example, of the, of the national narrative template of Russia, I would say, that is used to make sense of a lot of this list of different events in history. And it's, I mean, in a, in a simple way, you can say it's the same story with different characters. Okay, so the uh, Tatar is coming in, and, but the the uh, Teutonic Knights of the Germans, uh, the Alexander Nevsky being the hero that pushed them out, uh, the Poles, etc. So a whole list of these. In every case, what we're saying here is the same basic plot, it's the same narrative template that's used to make sense from a Russian perspective now, of course. Um, although, again, when I go through here and talk about Russia, in the end, it's our invitation to invite ourselves to think, well, what about America? What about Georgia? What about uh, India? What about China? Because everybody, I think, is operating with similar kind of cognitive uh, capacities here. So we have this schematic, schematic plot, a very general plot, that applies to all of these. And at the same time, we have a Russian particularism, the narcissistic, uh, the ethnocentric narcissism. <clears throat> okay, so what evidence do we have? You know, what, how can I, I as an outsider, because I'm looking at Russian texts, how can I, what evidence do I have that this template is at work?
sometimes I would say you could see it even in the terms of play. So we have this term, the Great Fatherland War, and we have the Fatherland War. Okay, then we have this is a, it's the same thing here, but young people in Russia tend to know this expression, Hitler as a second Napoleon. In America, we can understand what that means if we have if we know something about history, but it's not something that most Americans would ever say. They would never use that expression, but this is something that's pretty familiar uh, to young people in Russia that I've talked to. And you can see that in visual, kind of this same story, different characters. You look at Eisenstein's Alexander Nevsky. Uh, it's, to me, this is amazing. I've watched this movie sometimes, but then when I looked at it again, I realized the Teutonic Knights, about two-thirds of the way into the movie, are running around in this 1938 film with Wehrmacht, German war helmets, uh, on. And so it's the same story, different character. Uh, and it suggests the existence of this template for making sense of many different events through the same lens of the same narrative template. Um, okay, so this is kind of summarizing some of those things. Um, Ethnocentric perspective, the Russian demonic, we could say demonic community, what holds the Russian community together. If you ask, you know, what, what's Russian national mean? From this perspective, it means they have the same way of making sense of the past. It's a mnemonic or memory community. You know, this is a common way of saying, what is a nation? It's a, a nation is a collective that shares memories. It's one of the crucial defining properties of a nation. Um, it's quite different from the mnemonic uh, narrative tool, tools used by other memory communities. Um, Americans don't make sense of the world in the same way. French don't. Georgians don't. I, I, I'll come to some examples here. And I would say it's important, for example, here also to note that sometimes our first reaction to this is to say, oh, well, that's because the Soviet state or the Russian state, you know, that's the only thing they know. That's imposed from the state. And so that's kind of an imposition from the top down. I think it's much more complicated than that. I think all of us carry this cultural DNA in a way that there's a lot of cultural continuity from the bottom up. And the state, yes, it does reinforce that, but it doesn't come only from the state. The state's in us in a lot of ways, and this, the official history you find in history textbooks reflects that. It doesn't create it out of nothing. So I think I, the underlying code talks about there's a lot more bottom up pressure, there's a lot more cultural force here than simply being imposed from the top down by the state. And also I just say, to say that the Russians have a national narrative template is not to say they just imagine things, they make up things out of nothing. Obviously they have been invaded. Now why they were invaded, you know, who was responsible, we can talk about a lot, but the fact is, if you look at that list of events, they have undergone massive invasions, massive tragedies many times. So, I'm not suggesting by talking about an narrative template that they just imagine these things and make them up. Uh, no, I think it, it has to be a combination of based on evidence, but an interpretation of evidence. <clears throat> an interpretation can be very strong. Sometimes, it, this is what gets to me to be very interesting from a Western perspective, from an American perspective. Sometimes Russians can plot certain events that I can understand why they would say, well, Napoleon and Hitler are similar. But then there's a way of interpreting things, other kinds of invasions that are very surprising to America. If we grew up on anti-communist perspective, we thought communism is a Russian idea, it's something that they're trying to take over the world, you know, in my generation. So then it's very striking in post-Soviet times to hear somebody like Solzhenitsyn say, Alexander Solzhenitsyn say, communism was actually a kind of invasion. It was an invasion by ideas into the Russian soul. It almost destroyed Russian civilization. It was an alien idea. It wasn't a Russian idea. It was a German idea, or a Jewish German idea, or something like that from Marx. And so the way, suddenly, to make sense of communism as an external invasion of the Russian uh, demonic community is very strange for an American who, got, who grew up thinking that the Russians were the ones trying to export. They were the ones who created this and wanted to invade other people. But now there's a way of making sense of communism and capitalism, by the way. But it's not nothing, nothing. It's nothing new, really. If you read, uh, what is it? What's the name of the book? Biersi. Biersi. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, the idea of demons. The way we translate that book of Dostoevsky, a demon. It, we've been Russians have been invaded by demons. Okay. Western nihilism, Western rationalism. Okay. It's not a physical invasion necessarily, but it's uh, a kind of invasion of another sort that uses the same narrative template, the same cultural DNA to make sense of it.
Okay, so I just wanted to say a few words about, so why are we so emotionally attached to these things? Why do Indians and Pakistanis and Israelis and Palestinians and Estonians and Russians have impossible time to understand one another? Why do we get so emotional about this? Um, because we have a deeply, uh, deep attachments to these. And if you, well, I'll talk about it. If you, when you challenge the narrative, when Estonians say, actually, you want to have that monument there because you say that's liberation. We say that was occupation. When you challenge the story, liberation, occupation, somehow we challenge the very identity of the people. There are ways of challenging American identity by saying, you know, American history is not really about bringing freedom to people. It's actually about genocide on the, you know, on the continent of North America. Well, that's not something that somehow most Americans can ever believe that's possible for you to think, although we know some historical facts support that. But we're, if you challenge our narrative or you challenge the Russian narrative, it's a threat to our identity somehow. And so it's, that's one key, why it's uh, so threatening, why it's so emotional. Um, <clears throat> basically, for the Russians, to have somebody call 1944 a time of occupation is really not only incompatible or inconsistent or uh, impossible from a, the invasion of uh, alien enemies idea, it's, really, it's deeply offensive. It, it hurts their, their whole idea of an uh, identity, and they find it, uh, they just can't imagine how you could get this idea, and how you, and they find it offensive that somebody would say this. But, in the case of uh, the bronze soldier, in the stud in um, Tallinn, actually, the bronze soldier in the Russian demonic community was known as Sasha, but at least underground in the Estonian community in uh, Tallinn who is known as the Stalin Rapist. And those are two completely different ideas about what this bronze soldier is, of course. Um, so why, so, why the emotion? Why is it such a threat to identity? And I think the key here is to understand, again, now we're going back to memory versus history. Memory always involves a commitment to two things. Not, history is about, you can say, history is about knowledge about the past, period. That's what the, uh, the goal of history, formal history, is to know about the past, to argue about the past, but to know about the past. But when we talk about memory, we're always talking about, yes, you do know about the past, but a memory is not simply knowledge about the past, it's about the past that I have witnessed. Okay? That's, it has to be those two elements, the two dual commitment to have memory. So you have the presence of the same agent in the past and the presence. I'm the one remembering, but I was there to get the original information, okay? This is something that comes from, um, uh, I don't know if I have it up here, but uh, William James had this notion in the uh, uh, 19th century, actually, what he called the weeness, yeah, the, the meanness, that is, it's about me, the center of memory in me. So when I remember something, I am remembering it now, but I was there to observe the original event, too. And if, if it turns out that I wasn't there, then we say, well, that's not a memory. You weren't there. You, you imagine that. That's not memory. So memory always involves this kind of dual commitment. Um, and furthermore, it's not just kind of neutral cognitive witnessing. It's a kind of, you have a moral, uh, you have kind of a, the moral authority if you were there. So when we talk about events you remember, and somebody says, well, you know, uh, I, th I think uh, I read in the newspaper the other day that there was an auto accident in uh, Rustavelli and uh, somebody got seriously hurt and so I think the guy was probably drunk. And if you were there you'd say, you don't know, I was there. I was there, the guy definitely was not drunk. And you have, not because you actually have that much more information oftentimes, but because you have moral authority of being the witness, you can now remember as opposed to just know about the past. You have this kind of dual uh, a commitment, whereas somebody reading about the past or reporting about the past, they can know a lot of information, but they don't have a moral authority. This is a huge problem in formal history. Historians say the last person you want to trust about a historical event is an eyewitness, somebody who was actually there. So historians say, no, we're not going to listen to that, we'll get other forms of evidence. And this is offensive, though, to many people who were there. And this is, it comes up all the time in memory of the Holocaust. People who are in the Holocaust, if you find out that part of their memory is wrong, uh, and there have been many instances of this, not because they lied, but because they remember there were two chimneys in Auschwitz and there were three chimneys in this, this terrible camp, and somebody showed them, here's a picture, you have it wrong, there were three chimneys, not two. That still doesn't, for us, they say, well, that's just a little mistake, but she still has moral authority because she was there. 
you historian were not there. Okay? So it's a different way of relating to the past, and it's built into memory that there's a kind of moral authority of the witness, the moral witness, of the moral authority of witnessing that's built in there. Well, so what's this got to do with collective? That's about individual memory, you could say. Just as William James talked about the meanness of memory, that is the dual commitment, I was there and I remember it now, I think there's a kind of thing we could say there's a meanness in collective memory. In the case of you know, like the young people in Nashi, or the Estonian young people, they were not alive in 1944. What did they know about 1944? But somehow they're very emotional about this. It's not just history. They're reacting as if they were there. And in a sense, they were. I think that's the key. There's this kind of imaginary leap that we make that when they talk about we liberated the Baltics, it wasn't the kids who were born in 1974 or 1984, or when the Baltic kids say, well, we were occupied, they weren't alive. You know, that's way before their birth time. So <clears throat> in what sense are they, we imagine this we that is similar, I think, to the me that James is talking about. That's what makes it memory and not history. Because now we're imagining that my people remember this, and somehow that uh, my people are the agent, have moral authority that your people never can. Okay? I think uh, what's interesting about this is when we do these kinds of collective memory exercises, I don't think they just reflect this commitment to the we, but they actually help create it. I think there are more people who are more nationalistic at a young age in Estonia and Russia today as a result of this memory debate over the Bronx soldier. So, again, if you challenge the liberation narrative, as the young Estonians are, that's a threat to us. It's not a threat to me personally, in some sense, but a threat to me personally because I'm part of the Russian us, or we, as well. Okay, so to summarize here, you're saying national memory is what we're looking at as an underlying code. It's not history. I mean, history is something different, uh, as I've tried to say it several times. Uh, this national memory is based on narrative tools uh, that are, at the one time, very general and schematic. So that the Russian uh, national narrative template of expulsion of foreign enemies, it applies to a lot of different events. And so it's very general, generalized in its application. But at the same time, it has this ethnocentric narcissism. It's a narrative template that has one national perspective built into it. It looks at the world from this perspective and it has a hard time believing that you can see it from any other perspective. Um, what this means is that national narratives tend to be very resistant to counter evidence. There's no amount of evidence that you can use a lot of times to convince somebody, you know, your national narrative of that account or that event was wrong. Uh, it's very hard to resist that. The challenge to the narrative uh, means a challenge to our collective identity and the moral authority of the we, that is, the group identity. And I again remind us that all of everybody, I mean, it's not, this isn't a story just about Russians. This is a story about all modern nation states that huge, devote huge resources to teaching history, what they call history, history, but it's usually a mix of history and memory, I would say. Every nation state in the world today spends huge resources committing itself to getting young citizens to be loyal to the national narrative. So yes, they do that in Russia. We do it in America, as I was telling somebody earlier today, I just read a story about one of our people, a Republican who's going to run for president in the United States probably. His name is Newt Gingrich, the former congressman. And he just gave a, gave a presentation to a large religious gathering in America, uh, a kind of major evangelical Christian group, and talking about, I'm afraid that the current Democratic administration is trying to make us forget about the past. We won't remember that we are Christian, Judeo-Christian at our core. And uh, this is a problem because we have more Muslims, we have more other people, and there, there are different ideas about what the national narrative of America is. But somebody coming out of that meeting said, thank God for Newt Gingrich. We have to have people who know their history. If we don't know the history, we're all lost. So if we in America do this very much. Uh, we have a national memory. Russians have a national memory, you have a national memory in Georgia, et cetera. And I think the key, though, is to understanding why we are so emotionally attached to this and why we have these mnemonic standoffs is to understand this weeness of memory and the narrative template parts of memory. So with that, I think that's my last slide. And I would actually be very interested in hearing your reactions or corrections to what I have to say. Yeah.
Ahí está. So, uh, memory versus uh, history, yeah? It is the two ways of looking to the past. I'm sorry for my English. <clears throat> Do you think they are compatible, or what is the perspective in the future to uh, compare them, or the history must win or not? Or right. Yeah, I mean, it's, this is an age old question because it really has to do with something like Plato. It says, Memory is an emotional identity commitment, and we're, in a sense, the Enlightenment age is an attempt to say, yes, you can have that, but we have to have something to control the emotions. And that's what I think is what's happening with history. It's an attempt to say, uh, it's a controlling factor. Memory is much more emotional, much more difficult, uh, and when we get into conflict, our memories come forward, we forget about history, but we have to keep trying, I think, to have history to control these other otherwise dangerous. So it's a constant struggle, I think, and uh, I don't. I hope neither one wins entirely ever. Thank you. Certainly, in a sense, I think, in which communism fit onto Russian culture more naturally than it did ever on German culture, for example, or America. We had a communist party for 60 years, but nobody paid attention to it in America. So uh, there's this kind of idea of collective societies that are more susceptible to communism or something like that. Uh, but Russia changed communism, too, of course, to make it Marxism and Leninism. But what my comment here in Solzhenitsyn is about is not about what really happened. It's not about history, it's about memory. Yeah. And then when you say, well, why is, why is post-Soviet Russia having so much trouble? It's because we have a foreign invader. And I think that's a memory claim. And so it's a difference between what an analysis would do to say, are these compatible in reality in some kind of objective way, as opposed to a way of remembering why we have this problem today. Well, we had another enemy that came, and it almost destroyed us. And so that's a memory about the past, it's a memory, not history. So, but I, I, so I don't think I disagree with you, but there are two different issues of uh, what we're talking about there. Say it to me what? The memory can, can be changed, changed by, memory politics, can be changed by state. politics. By uh, state politics? Oh, by, can memory be changed by state politics? Yeah. Okay. It can, but it's really, really hard, I think. I mean, that's, I think that's the bottom up issue here. I think, for example, um, well, it depends on what, what the aspects of memory we're talking I think it would be very hard, for example, in America. For somebody to do a lot of research, and for there's some, it will never happen, but some government to be, you know, some party to win the presidency and the Congress and to say, the real history of America is the history of class struggle. And we shouldn't talk about all this, you know, freedom and stuff. We should talk about class struggle. There are people who write histories of that sort. There's a very famous guy named Howard Zinn who takes every episode of American history, says, you know, the Boston Tea Party, 
that wasn't about freedom. That was about a mer merchants, uh, you know, hiring cheap labor to go and cr cause problems and cause labor unrest. It was a class struggle. My point is, I don't think any government in the United States could say the real national narrative for America is the history of the narrative of class struggle, because the bottom-up forces are too strong to say no. Uh, the, the cultural DNA is too strong saying, no, we're basically a story about freedom and bringing freedom to the world or something like that. In the Russian case, I think they did try in certain ways to, to get rid of, to change the national narrative. Um, and I don't think they succeeded, the Soviet case, I mean. Uh, I don't think they succeeded over a 70-year period. Uh, they, what tends to happen is not just usually when two narratives come into contact and one wins and one loses. There's a way of incorporating information. So, for example, um, for a long time, Soviets absolutely said there was no, there were no secret protocols to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. They denied this for a long time. Only Gorbachev said, oh, you know, I found a secret document and we did have a secret protocol with, uh, between Molotov and Ribbentrop. Uh, and so, historically, now we have to recognize this. And that would seem, actually, the Estonians thought this would be a very powerful antidote that the state would now have to recognize to change this idea of liberation. But what happened very quickly, uh, if you watch the history textbooks as they developed in Russia, at first they recognized this and they didn't know what to do with that fact because it's an embarrassing fact. If you suddenly say, okay, actually there was a secret protocol that we decided where to divide up things and that, that was illegal. But pretty soon the textbooks evolved to the point where they started talking about Stalin's difficult choice, which is an old story actually. It said, Stalin did not want to do anything illegal to take over the Baltics, but he either could do that and save the world from fascism, or he could be technically legal and be more militarily vulnerable. So the, my point here is that even when a state tries to change things, it tends to slip back into keeping the underlying narrative intact in the end, I think. It's a more subtle process. And states do try to change these sometimes, but I think that it's very, that's, it's a sad thing in a lot of ways, because I think they're very resistant to change. And uh, sometimes they could be changed. We could have a more peaceful world, maybe, if we could do this. But I, I don't, I think it's, it's very, the best we can do oftentimes is to say, you know, as a young person, you should know not only this official state narrative, the memory, but you should at least be exposed to the other narrative and be serious about studying it for a while. At least to understand there is another alternative. But people still tend to believe the, the basic one, I think. I don't know if that makes sense to you or not. No. Okay, my example is over. Let's consider Georgian reality. Okay, just a few years ago, 10 years ago, Stalin was here or here in Georgia. Now, no. Maybe we had not information or cable, but the long question is simple if you see it from this point of view. We go over the world again, this phenomenon, right? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think. When you mentioned about information, I, I think usually these are not cases about having information. I think they're cases of the underlying cultural DNA, the underlying uh, code. Uh, I, mean, I, I lived in the Soviet Union, I lived in Moscow in the 1970s for a year. And as an American, I went there and I thought, boy, if they could just read, if they could just watch our television channels, or if they could just hear the, openly hear the BBC, or if they could just read Time magazine, then they would see that, uh, you know, there's not, there's something really good about America. I don't think it's a matter of just information. I think, you know, we're very powerful cognitive misers. misers. We're very powerful schema. We, we use things in simple ways that are based on our identity. So I don't want to be pessimistic, too pessimistic about this, but I think it's usually what happens, there's a way for the underlying narrative to absorb new information and not to change itself, not at the deep level. <laughs> How would you describe cultural DNA of Georgians if you have looked into it? <laughs> yeah. How would I describe the cultural DNA of Georgia? You know, I, I shouldn't describe that for you because you have an expert in the room here. That's uh, the said student that works with me, Mr. Batyashvili. Uh, she's trying to figure that out. Uh, but I think, you know, when I talk about this kind of uh, national narrative templates, I think actually there are very few of these in humans. They're not. There are not 200 of them if we have 200 members of the UN. You know, I think they're at the schematic level, I don't know, there are maybe five or ten or something, very few because they're so general. But I think one of the things you'd like to see in many 
and this is true of Estonia too, but many small nations, there's a story about we survived despite all these you know, invasions, somehow we kept our national essence intact. Um, but there, uh, I mean, there are just different national narratives, it seems to me, about uh, we held, we survived in the face of all these invaders, but now there's other discussions about we were internally uh, self-destructive sometimes. And so th these are different, and there's a golden age, a golden age national narrative is a very uh, common one in many places in the world where you see we had a golden age and we want to come back to the golden age. I mean, so we try to come back. So America, uh, we, we don't have a golden age narrative that we use in the same way. So, but, the, you know, this golden age, survival in the face of a uh, small nation in the face of big uh, invasions, Inva you know, expulsion of the alien enemies and, you know, sort of Russia talks about. So there are a few of being on a mission from God of some kind. There are uh, very few of these. But then everyone thinks, everyone will say, though, Oh, my country's narrative is completely unique. Nobody else has. And in a sense, that's true. But in another sense, I think there's similarities to what you find out. But I think that's really what <laughs> hopefully she will tell us in the years to come. Yeah. Uh, my question is how this nation of narrative is passed from one generation to the second generation? <laughs> and when these pass, do you think there is a uh, role of the education system plays? And if it, yes, then uh, do you think there is a difference between the uh, when the education system is, uh, when the education is supplied by the private companies and when the education is controlled by the state? Yeah. No, I, if I knew the answer to those, uh, it'd be, you, you would have heard a lot more. But I think um, the best we know is probably a lot of this goes on in school, but perhaps even more goes on in other kind of identity forming settings. Um, and that could be family, national monuments, uh, things like that. I mean, from generation to generation. I, and what's striking, it's always been striking to me in a place like this, uh, Georgia, is that even when the state official during the Soviet period, some decades, said you cannot talk about certain things, and you will not talk about certain things in public school instruction, uh, many of the things still maintain themselves across generations in private settings. So, um, and then for me, that's a, that's a big mystery because we've got first candidate, we usually say, well, the schools do this. The schools can, but in Soviet Georgia and Soviet Russia, for many people, the schools were just objects of resistance, actually. They were not convincing. If you, if you heard that in your school, is somebody said, A happened, and they go home and they say, no, A did not happen, and you're likely to believe not A. So the answer, the real answer is that we don't know very much about how this, I mean, in general, we, we know the candidates, but we don't understand the power of each of these in different contexts. It's a huge... But certainly schools have to be, to take responsibility as much as they can to try to work this out and provide the best alternatives, to the, you know, and I think, and historical alternatives as well as memory alternatives to the students. That's an ethical statement, not a factual one. Yeah. I think one of the possibilities uh, where we're talking about uh, possible change of uh, national narrative is global now is to look where several narratives compete within one group. Uh, there are some cases, and Georgia is one such when you can see, say, traditionalist also this narrative competing with modernization narrative, mm -hmm. postmodern narrative, third one. So, uh, it would be interesting to look at this, how these uh, narratives, which are all three coming from memory, not from history, but still, how can they influence each other to make uh, less kind of emotional and uh, to add some uh, kind of light of reason to this kind of thing. Yeah. This interior domestic kind of dialogue is an important, important thing. And also I think the students would love to know that all national narratives are uh, kind of thing, they are either covertly dialogical, Many national narratives uh, are spoken not in Marlowe, but there is somebody with whom you compete. Right. Like I said, when Armenians speak of their narrative, they compete with Georgia, <coughs> and the other way around, of course. Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a, the issue of that dialogicality. I mean. Right, no, no, I think it's a really good one. Jerome always corrects me on these things, but it's, we talked about this. So, and it's something I didn't say much about here. We sh in a sense, we shouldn't even talk about collective memory, we should talk about collective remembering. Because remembering is a very active process, and usually it's not just one narrative. There's always competition of some kind. 
going subtle or not so subtle competition. And so it's more like a uh, kind of a, a boxing ring or a wrestling ring. You're in the ring, and only certain players can be in the ring in a particular setting, but they're, they're always struggling with one another. There's not just one. Although the dream of the totalitarian state, of course, is to just impose one and everybody else will be gone. But nobody's, thank goodness, nobody's ever been able to do that. So yeah, there's a lot of struggle, dialogicality going on. A lot of times we have a story because we're denying another story that has been imposed on us. Now one more question, man. You know, uh, you know uh, again, memory, again, history, but there is a third way to look to the, uh, of the past, yeah? It is something like philosophical. Uh, Ethno-philosophy or something like, I, I'll give you an example, maybe in, uh, it will be more clear. There's uh, one Russian histor historian, uh, Yakovenko, he said, uh, wrote such a phrase, that Russian Bolshevik revolution was the total response of the deep, uh, uh, ethnic norm or something like that to the westernization of Russia. Mm -hmm. And this uh, deep uh, norm was the following. Uh, everybody must be equal in poverty. So what you will say about such kind of thinking? Is it memory? Is it mm -hmm. uh, history? Is it Something yeah. More. No, it's a good question. Urat I think. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, uh, I, I, I don't mean uh, concretely yeah. this. Yeah. But I, I mean such uh, vision. But I think uh, issues like equality, equal opportunity, but not equality of outcome, liberty, uh, things like those are probably values that have to be shaped, reflected in the narratives. But I don't think they're necessarily. Uh, you know. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. I badly expressed what I mean. Yeah. For example, uh, this is Yakovenko's uh, idea about Russia. There is about something, uh, somebody says that Germans always uh, are expensing and invading each other, they are uh, barbarians, uh, uh -huh. etc. Maybe in a more clever and uh, <clears throat> yeah, sophisticated way. Uh, what kind of uh, Domain is such kind of ideas uh -huh. and analysis. Is it history? Is it memory? Is it something meta history? Or no, I, I think it's probably something meta because for me, both memory and history use narrative tools. And the kinds of things you're talking about are values of some kind of or something like that. And so uh, they have to be compatible, but it's a good point. And it could be reflected in both. Or, uh, but yeah, there is a kind of commitment to. You know, Birgit said the Russian idea was not so much a story, but an idea. Uh, and so, and we have ideas like or values like that, or something. It's something I don't think uh, this really distinguishes for or really handles. Thank you. I have a question. What is your opinion about Birgit's ideas <laughs> of Russian communists? What's my idea about Gurdjieff's idea of Russian communism? I think now you're probably getting out of my league. I mean, you're more experts here about uh, Russian communism and Gurdjieff. And I think, in some ways, it, it, it's uh, reflected what I mentioned about Solzhenitsyn. I, I think, you know, it's, uh, the, um, there is a narrative of uh, Russian spirituality, and communism was actually alien to it. It was a foreign invader. That, I mean, that's a, not a very thoughtful answer because I haven't thought about that. But it's, it's crucial because if you talk about Russian idea, the first people, person you think about would be Berdyaev. I need to do some more research on that before I give you a good answer. Yeah, we do have a. Thank you. Okay, what's the goal of the study? I think the goal of the study here is to understand what forces are at work when we try to change something like official state curricula for history. That's one goal. 
Uh, and I think it's also to try to understand what motivates somebody who's across the table from me talking to me in negotiations and when we just cannot understand one another. I'll give you one example. Um, in America, we have a very clear narrative about a spe specific narrative about what happened in Hiroshima. And it's consistent with our national narrative, which I didn't talk about, but <clears throat> we bombed, we used an atomic bomb in Hiroshima because we wanted to stop the war, and it succeeded in stopping the war. There's actually all kinds, that's the memory, there are all kinds of current contemporary historical accounts that dispute that. But just on memory basis, when I, in the 70s or 80s, would talk to Russian colleagues and say, well, we used it to stop the war. This is just received, accepted wisdom in the United States. Russian would look at me, you can't really believe that. Obviously, you use that in order to intimidate Stalin and the Soviet Union. It had nothing to do with stopping the war. And I said, well, yeah, I do believe that. And, I, and then I realized I'm suddenly getting very uh, defensive about what I take to be just reality. How could, then I started thinking, oh, the, the guy across the table, he's just trying to be provocative or maybe he brainwashed. That's the wrong place to go. The right place, I think, is to say, okay, where could you get that idea? And these things continue to happen when I talk to Chinese colleagues. On certain, they can agree on many things, but on certain events of the past, they just cannot believe that I think there's one story. And I have a hard time believing they think there's another. And that, in order to avoid unnecessary and kind of stupid conflict there, I think, hopefully by digging under these, we could have a way of at least having a chance of being objective to say, okay, now I understand where you're coming from. But also when we try to make our own official histories, we need to know what is it we're arguing against in the way of memory. Japanese collect the memory about the Hiroshima attack. Um, it depends on who you ask. If you ask the Japanese or the Chinese. Yeah, Japanese, Japanese. <laughs> um, I think that, well, actually, I want to actually want to talk about the Chinese interpretation of this. And it's not just the Chinese, but a lot of people say what the bombing of Hiroshima did was allow the Japanese to have a victim stance uh, coming out of World War II, as opposed to the because in China, the Japanese still were the aggressors, and they were terrible aggressors. They're still resentful. But they said the atomic bomb actually served to let them remember the war as peace, peaceful, as people who want to have peace, who are victims of the only atomic bomb attacks in history, etc. So it's a lot of politics in this. But I think most, actually, I think most Japanese I know though would say. They, and I don't know this is just how much they bought it from America, where we came in there and kind of controlled everything for a while. They said, no, it stopped the war. But there's a lot of evidence that actually the Japanese were going to stop the war no matter what, how they were, they were looking for ways to stop the war. And we might have used the atomic bomb because it, we had it. We had it developed. There are tremendous pressures for people who have used all this energy to produce it, so to speak and not use it would be politically difficult for Truman. It gets to be much more complicated, but the memory is we used it to stop the war and it succeeded. We saved lives. We saved American lives. We actually saved Japanese lives by using an atomic bomb in the long run. That's an American, that's the, the memory. And uh, the, the reason, you know, some of you can find it humorous is because now we know, especially if you're not American, you say, why? How could you believe that? But if you talk to young people, it would be interesting. That's why I hope you have more contact. If you talk to a bunch of young American students, almost all of them say, if they know much about it, they say, well, we used it to stop the war, period. And we save lives in doing it. And they'd be surprised that you would have an alternative perspective. But that's exactly what we need, I mean, to partly answer your question as well, to have some experience running into quite different interpretations. Say, wow, how could you believe that? Well, maybe they have some facts for starters or something. So, yeah. But that's the power of the emotional attachment here, because for you to, to say you didn't use it to stop the war, somehow that's an attack on American identity. I mean, a lot of Americans can get, well, hey, admit it, don't tell me. Uh, you know, it, it get emotional exactly on the, these kinds of issues. That's where we are. <laughs>
A very good question. I think, um, as far as collective memory goes, the answer would probably be still World War II. But you're talking about something that's even deeper than collective. Because that's about a particular big event. You're talking about the formation of mentalities or something. I think, and it's a, it's, it's for that reason, it's a good question. I think it's a different level in which past experience that you don't remember in detail very much could have a bigger impact on you than the, the events that you do remember. Uh, you know, like you find in a history textbook. Everybody knows the Mongols came, you know. But there's a lot of historical research that shows they actually created more of the Russian and the Soviet kind of governmental structure. Um, they don't remember the episode of the Mongols coming, but you remember it in a sense of everyday life, the way everyday life is organized and mentality. So it's a question that goes beyond actually what I'm kind of pushing here is, but it's a good one, another chapter. <laughs> Zalian Didi Maglov asked if for the 